John chapter 10. We're going to talk tonight about uh, grace word. We don't have to review the last class because we just did it, didn't we? Am I right? Hello. Okay. We're going to talk about a grace word. And there's some, an interesting point here um, about the voice of God. I was thinking today that in Isaiah 40, you don't have to look there, but I just want to, let's read the first verse and we'll go to Isaiah. Verily, verily, John 10, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And that phrase struck me when I was driving down to the plaza tonight, the Bible school. Climbs up some other way. He climbs up some other way. That's interesting. He's actually like, he's ascending up another way. And he says these are thieves and robbers. And really, with interpretation, without interpretation that's done correctly, a person or a group of people or a denomination is climbing up another way. Really, it's, it's very interesting when you look at it. Climbing up another way. And he goes into some of the aspects of, of uh, different people in John 10 versus the one who follows the voice of God. And I'll go into that a little bit later. But do you know, I'm sure you have uh, maybe thought about this, have you ever thought about the damages of what wrong interpretation does? I, I'm talking about worldwide, and then I'm talking about, you know, secondly, in our own practical lives. Worldwide, look, look what can happen. First of all, Israel, Dr. Stevens said this the other night, and it struck me, Israel wanted a lion, and they got a lamb. That's, that's because of what? Wrong interpretation. They didn't look at Isaiah 53. They didn't understand Leviticus and all the offerings. They didn't understand Genesis 22. I, I still want you to pay attention to class because there might be a, a, another one. Of the, <laughs> they didn't listen to Genesis 22 when God told Abraham God will provide himself a lamb. They didn't understand Zechariah chapter 12 and 13 about the coming, all the prophecies, which were hundreds of prophecies concerning the coming of the Son of God. Daniel chapter 7, Psalm 22, the book of Leviticus. See, it's very interesting to me. They wanted a lion, but they got a lamb. And that's because of wrong interpretation. You could say that wrong interpretation, and we understand the eternal thought of God and the eternal plan of God, but in their personal case, wrong interpretation killed him. They killed the prince of life, Acts 3.15. 14 to 15, they killed the prince of life. And we know he rose again because they couldn't kill him. But in reality, it was wrong interpretation. Can a prophet come out of Galilee? Well, number one, he's not just a prophet. He's God the Son, you know? So wrong interpretation. Number two, in regards to wrong interpretation, they wanted the Messiah to be a king on the throne. They didn't understand a cross. The Messiah came to go on a cross, to die for the sins of the world. Wrong interpretation. They, and five things that you can misinterpret that are instrumental and cause massive error. Five things you can misinterpret. Are you with me? Are you there? Okay, the test is over. Relax. I know you were nervous. Number one, they interpret the person of Jesus Christ as the God-man. Wrong interpretation. Number one, the person of God, who he is. Okay? There's a book. What's that book that talks about? Um, it's by J.B. Phillips. It's a good book to read. I, could recommend, I don't recommend many books, but I read that many years ago. And it um, talks about... Some interpret him as a pale Galilean, a father above creation. Um, I'll think of the title in a, in, a, in a moment, but it's a really good book when it comes to biblical interpretation, how people view God. What is it? Your God is too small. It's a, I mean, I don't recommend many books, believe me, because I don't read many, 
but that is a good one because it gives so many viewpoints of what, of, and it's a very small little book. You can get it, and Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips, okay? So they interpret, they interpret Christ, Jesus Christ differently, the God-man. Number two, their interpretation of the cross, the finished work, wrong interpretation of what he did. That's why I believe many people can believe that Jesus Christ is God and he's the Son of God, but they don't believe in the finished work, and I wonder if they can really get saved. I don't know. God knows. But I really believe salvation was said by, the, by John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. What's the second part? That takes away the sin of the world. See, if you believe that Jesus is God, but you don't believe in the finished work of the cross, and you believe you get saved by something you do, maybe you're not saved. Maybe many, all these people that we think are saved, is Catholicism saved? No. I don't care if they believe Jesus is God. They don't believe in the cross. They believe that they're, they're saved by being baptized, by keeping the sacraments. Am I right? So you know what? Salvation is between them and God. I'm not saying that some of them are not. Many of them are, but in all reality, they're climbing up another way. Climbing up another way. So the finished work. Number three, misinterpretation of grace. Not understand grace. Grace to many Christians even, even in our own ministry at times, grace has become a worn-out coin. It's a word that's used all the time, and it's not understood. You know, it's not understood. It's just God's favor. No, it's not. Grace is the fullness and glory of God, John 1, 14 through 17. Grace is every attribute of God, all 33 or 4 attributes of God and variations of his attributes. Misunderstanding of grace. They all get saved by grace, but then I got to work out my own salvation. Okay? Misunder misinterpretation of grace. Number four, mis misinterpretation of the body. Do not know what the church is. Who needs a church? I hear that all the time. Why go to church? Because they don't understand that the church is the body. The head is attached to the what? The body. So there's a great... Go through all Baltimore and talk to people. People are fed up with church because church has been misrepresenting what it's supposed to be. And so people don't even bother going. So misrepresenting, misinterpreting the body. Fifth misinterpretation is the gospel to the nations. Churches don't really believe it. I made a statement to a group of pastors one time. I said, if you really believed in hell, you'd be a soul winner. You're not a soul winner because you don't believe in hell. They didn't like it. And that's okay. I said, if you really believed in hell, you would, you would be, you'd care about lost people because you'd know that they're going there. But if you don't think they're going there, then, you know, or you think it's, maybe it's a figment of your scriptural imagination that you, misinterpret, you interpret it your own way, Annihilation or something. And by the way, all these people that believe that God elects some for salvation and some for to be lost, they are stupid. Those people are stupid people. We had a couple in our Bible school that believed that. They have every right to believe what they want. But don't get in my face with it. Because that makes me angry. You attack God's character. God, will, God knows who will make the right choice, who will make a choice. But God doesn't predestinate people to hell. How could that be the character of God? Misinterpretation. Calvinistic weirdos. By the way, most of them don't evangelize, and most of them don't care about lost people, and most of them don't care about missions because of the misinterpretation. And you can say, well, I'm not so sure I agree with you. Be wrong your whole life because you're wrong. Just in case you're listening the internet. I don't care. You know, it's like... So, misinterpretation. All right? The greatest misinterpretation of all. The greatest error ever made in interpretation was Jesus and the cross. All right? It's the greatest error of interpretation that's ever been made. Listen to some of these things. Okay? You didn't have to write them down, but I just was, I was running through my mind tonight. Uh, before I came here, JWs, 
Mormons, the Jesus-only people, Christian scientists, Muslims, Buddhists, Catholics, Pentecostals who don't believe in eternal security, Orthodox people who don't believe in being born again, baptismal regeneration, faith prosperity movement, signs, wonders, and miracles people, healing in the atonement, King James only crowd. Oh, they're saved, but uh, strange. Legalism with no grace. Seventh-day Adventist. There is multiplicity of error everywhere, okay? And it's all based on what? Second. Peter 1, 19 through 21, their own interpretation. Okay? No scripture uh, of preaching and teaching is for anybody's private interpretation. And it's amazing. Did I didn't I give you in this class the five false anointings? I did, didn't I? Hello? Well, Ula says yes and everybody else says no. <laughs> so I don't know. I taught it right here. It was a Tuesday night. Did I teach that here? Okay, this is, this is interesting. Five, five anointings that are energized by the devil into the human soul, not God initiating to the spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit connects with the human spirit and controls the soul of man. All right? But when a person is not regenerated or a person is saved but they're carnal, the enemy can initiate towards their soul which has complete domination in their life. Five false anointings from the five parts of the soul. False anointing number one, knowledge without life. Every, they know a lot but there's no life. It's all about, they know the Bible inside out. They can be JWs that know the Bible. They, want, they, can, they know a lot about the Bible. There can be people that are unsaved that know a lot about the Bible. There can be people that saved that know a lot about the Bible, but they have no life. And so they preach a lot of knowledge, but there's no life. Knowledge without life. That's the mind. The five parts of the soul. Part number one, the mind. Okay? They have the mind of God without the life of God. Are you with me? Number two, the second part of the soul is the emotions. Emotional people without truth. Oh, they're everywhere too, aren't they? You ever see all the weepers and criers all over the place on TV? There, aren't, they, aren't they there? They're very emotional. Emotional movements are everywhere. But there's no truth. So it's a false anointing. All right? It's just emotionalism. Number three, manipulation of the will. Holiness movement. They're always controlling how you dress, how you think, what you should give, how you should live. It's do this and don't do that. It's manipulation of the third part of the human soul, the will. Instead of allowing the grace of God to transform the person and that person responds with God's will towards decisions. Number four, a conscience attached to moral light, not spiritual light. The Pharisees had it. Stone the woman, right? John 8. That's, that's the conscience which determines the right and wrong. But if the conscience is attached to moral light, not spiritual light, it's a false anointing. Condemning and accusing people all over the place, okay? They have moral light. They're people that just, you know, oh, you don't live like that. You should live like that. Then number five, the fifth part of the soul is called your self-image. And they have a powerful personality, but it's not the person of God. It's a false anointing. Charismatic people that can control crowds. Adolf Hitler controlled people with amazing soul power and demon intervention. Jim Jones did it in Guyana. Had 900 people commit suicide. All right? Are you listening? Louis Farrakhan has that kind of a power. You, you bet your life when you hear him speak, he's got like, he, there's something there. Huh, but it's, it's an anointing from another kingdom. That's what it is. It's not God. 
And you can see these people that could move crowds, move massive amounts of people. And it happens in churches today that people can do that with a strong personality, but it's not God. So five false anointings. All right? Are you with, are you with me? So very important to understand that. And so all this stuff that's going on. And so what ends up happening in people's lives is now on a practical basis, we talked a little bit about all these errors we seem to know about. But look at, about, look at how if we don't interpret the Bible correctly, if we don't interpret the person of Christ, the work of the cross, the grace of God, the body of Christ and the gospel, we begin to make God in our own image. Now turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. This is a serious thing. This is why we need to have doctrine all the time in our lives. It's a serious thing because can, we can make God in our image and have him be how we want him to be to kind of justify our walk with God and our life. Are you with me? Somebody said to me recently, I'm getting married. I don't care what the church says. I said, well, don't expect the church to marry you. Well, why not? Oh, you just said I'm getting married. I don't care what the church says. We have a way of doing things, okay? But you're, you, you are convinced with your subjective, strangely attached mind to your unconscious past that you are going to do what you want and you are free to. You have a free volition. But I don't have to go along with your free volition, do I? <laughs> Interesting to me. And of course, when you don't do it, they, come, they attack you as being, you're not gracious. You knew what grace is, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Isaiah 40, verse 18, I'm sorry. To whom will you liken God? <laughs> do we try to make, like, here's, here, this, is wrong, this is wrong hermeneutics. Do we try to make God like us? or like our culture, or like America. You know, one of the biggest problems that missionaries have had going overseas is they try to evangelize and plant churches, and they try to make them American churches. What a stupid thing to do. What are you, what are you doing? Like somebody said to me, well, like, I don't think we should do the offering. They should do the offering the way we do it, not the way they do it. <laughs> What, what, are you, what are you trying to do? Mold them into your image? They've got to be a certain way. That's like denominational interpretation, right? Whom will you liken God? To whom will you liken God? So I want, do I want, do I not, maybe I do, I do it unconsciously. Try to make God like me. Bring God down. And then, instead of him being the potter and me the clay, I am the potter and he's the clay. And I make God out the way I want him to be. Somebody came into my office and said, you know what they said to me? I'm getting a little upset with God. I think he should be answering prayers so these people won't go home to be with the Lord and die of these things like cancer and illnesses. I said, well, you're a very interesting person. I said, have you ever read this verse in John 17? Jesus says, I pray that they will be with me where I am. So your prayer is to keep them here and God's prayer is he wants them there. So whose prayer is more powerful? How about, huh? Thy will be done, right? So you, just because people are not getting healed and you pray, 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 whatever. What about God's will, right? God took the Apostle Paul home at 63 years old. But he, uh, Titus lived to be 95. You want to, you, should Paul get up and say, what'd you do? This ain't right. My disciple lives to be 95 and I come home at 63? I had a lot to do down there. The time is over. Okay? William Borden died when he was about 30-something years old without accomplishing much of anything in most people's sight, but boy, did he accomplish a lot. And God said, I'm not, whom will you liken God to? So, in other words, I've got to be very careful. And uh, we're talking about, we're going from that whole thing about error, JWs, and all that, into our own personal interpretation of God. And understanding grace, Jesus, the finished work, the body, and the gospel. That, well, I don't, th I don't think God's a soul winner. Oh, okay. So 
Well, that's why I'm not. You just molded God, right? Huh? Hello? I don't think, you know, God wants me to just be un unto him alone. I don't want to be around a lot of people. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an exclusive. I, 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 don't do, I don't do fellowship well. Oh, okay. So you're likening God to you. Right? See, this is a serious thing. I liken God to me. And by the way, it's something that happens in all of our lives because we only know ourselves, correct? See, the greatest thing that can happen in my life is to know God and forget about me. Huh? Isn't that good? Forget about me. Oh, God, you know, we're really praying that God heals your knee. Well, I don't care if he does or doesn't. I don't care. What do I care if God heals it or he doesn't heal it? Him not healing, is that going to stop me from following him? Hey, you follow you because you wouldn't heal me. <laughs> Big baby. Oh, stop, will you? you know, my prayers, I've been praying. You know, this person was like angry at God. They're angry at God. Because he's not, why are these people like that? Why, you know? God wanted Pastor Stewart home, didn't he? Yeah, it was, it was, let's go. I am jealous for fellowship with you. Really, just leave it to God. I'm not going to like it, God, after me. Hey, hey, God, come over here. I want to like, kind of like mold you. Well, just you sit here and I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. Okay? This is how you're going to think, just like me. This is, how you, this is what your emotions are going to be like. This is the choices you're going to make. This is the conscience you're going to have. This is the self-image I want you to reveal. Okay? I'm the potter. Eternal God, you be the clay. Ooh. Who are you liking me? Look at verse 25. This is a common thing. This is what Israel did. This is what Israel did. That's why they rejected the prophets. They killed the Son of God. Verse 25, to whom will you liken me? Then watch this little statement. Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. Okay, so now, now you are equal with me. Okay? Am I equal, right? We're like kind of brothers. Somebody said to me Sunday morning, I almost wanted to vomit. He said to me, I don't call you pastor because you're my brother. I'm like, whatever. You know, that doesn't offend me. But you know what? The reason he said that is because he is not a submitted person. He never has been in the 30 years I've known him, and he still isn't. And he had to make that point to me, and I hadn't seen him in 15 years. Like, hello, can't we embrace and be thankful that we're both still alive and walking with God? You've got to make a point to tell me that you're my brother. You're not, uh, I don't call anybody pastor. Like, wow. Wow, isn't that awesome? Is that the whole thing your life is about? Huh? I don't care what a person says that, but I, it reveals something. Does the, does the Bible say pastor? Huh? Well, okay, I mean, I'm just like, that's what the Bible says. 1 Peter 5, 4, Acts 20, 28, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Jeremiah 3, 50. You want me, I can give you 50 verses where it uses the word poimian or raha in the Hebrew. I mean, come on. But I, I mean, I'm not a, I, I'm not, it's not an offense to me, but it's, it's, it strangely reveals He's making God in his image. You know? You know it, says Jesus, it says in Jesus. So what are you going to call Jesus when you get to heaven? Brother? <laughs> How's it going, brother? <laughs> Thank you. You'll have a great time. You'll be in the far part of heaven. You might get fellowship, like, you know, <laughs> real close fellowship once every 250,000 years. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I know. But it's just interesting to me, you know? Whom are you like in God? Whom will you liken God to? Whom will you liken God to? And uh, boy, how interesting. Now, let's go back to John chapter 10. Climbing up another way. Climbing up another way. We're still kind of on the topic of voices, and we're talking about tonight, the, the overall topic will be the, the voice of grace, because how important it is for us to understand the character of God. Chapter 10, verse 1, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door 
into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. I'll tell you, Jesus didn't like, like use light words here. And I will interpret them a little bit later on because there's four or five words I want us to understand. He that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, are you with me? To him the porter opens and the sheep do what? Akuo, hear his voice. And the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Isn't that awesome? He just, we are his sheep. We hear his voice. He calls us by name. He leads us out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his what? You know, one of the, one of the great reasons why we follow God is we know his voice. You just got to hear the voice of God, that's all. I know God's voice. If we, if we get to know God's voice, we will follow God. And it may not be something that is uh, much agreed upon by other people, but we follow his voice. Are there people in your family that really wanted you to be a, a musician, a song leader, a singer, an engineer, uh, you know, whatever? I mean, maybe a lot of people had a lot of plans for us. Just interesting to me. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. They just know it's a stranger. They don't need to know anything else. A, they know not the voice of the stranger. Okay? And that's a good indication of why I don't have to study all kinds of false religions. If I, when, when, you are, when you join the government and you're there to find out what a counterfeit bill is, you don't study 800,000 or 850 types of counterfeits. You study and you memorize a perfect $100 bill. And when you've memorized a perfect $100 bill, you know a counterfeit. So when I study about the, one, the perfect one and the truth, I don't, need, I don't need to study about Islam and Buddhism. I'm going to China. I've got to study up and get about 80 books on Buddhism. Duh. What, what, come on. Whose missionary school have you gone to? Huh? The school of subjectivity, religious subjectivity. I don't do that. I've got time for all, that, all the strangers' voices. Because if you're not, you're not careful... It just might find yourself having those voices in your head. You read enough JW literature, you might start to question who God is. Am I right? You, know, you, read, you read enough of the wrong stuff and listen to enough of the wrong stuff, you become the wrong stuff. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then he said unto them again. Aren't you glad he does that again? You didn't get it? Here we come again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not akuo them. The sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes, cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not. Don't you like that? Sheep don't belong to hirelings. And there's a lot of hirelings around. But the sheep don't. By the way, you don't have to uh, ever be a, have allegiance to a hireling. There's a lot of churches that have pastors that are hirelings. I don't even know why people go to them. They have no obligation to go. They don't care if your uncle's the pastor or your, your sister. <laughs> or it's your family church, you know. You know, what, you know what I was told? You leave this church and, do, and never bring, never come to our house again. I said goodbye to my parents. They turned around later on in years. You leave this church. You don't have your kids baptized in this church. We lived across the street from the, the, that church I went to. You know, you can picture out what it is. Italian and, you know, <laughs> Catholic, Okay. By the way, a priest was the first one that told me about being born again, so there's a balance there. All right? You, you, you don't get your children infant baptized, then you have become like an enemy. I said, good. A man's enemies will be there of his own household. 
How's that one? No, I, we went right at it. Me and my brother got saved, and we went right at the whole family. We're really sorry. I never, you know what? I remember one time I went to confirmation class, and I was chewing gum, and the, the priest slapped me in the face for chewing gum. And I got up in comp confirmation class and broke his nose. And it was the happiest day in my life until I got saved. Bent his nose the whole other way, and they kicked me out of the church. And that was good. It was better than my uncle, my, my cousin, my cousin Joey Eaton, who's in the witness protection program now. Uh, I don't know for what. He broke two, a priest's two legs with a baseball bat, so I was a lot nicer than him. It just shows you where we came from, you know? Yeah, he did it right in the churchyard, too. Like, he was just nuts, you know, he didn't care. Whatever. I don't know what that's got to do with anything. <laughs> it's so crazy. Okay, hirelings. Okay. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose sheep, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he doesn't cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. Now, listen to these different things he says. First of all, a thief and a robber. Listen to these definitions. A thief is the word kleptos, kleptis. K-L-E-P-T-E-S. A thief, kleptes, okay? K-L-E-P-T-E-S. This is like Judas. He's a secret, deceiving, fraudulent thief. He does it in secret. You know what, you know what I'm talking about? Huh? Have you ever had anybody in your life, or maybe it was you, that was a secret, fraudulent thief? Huh? He's saying that these people, and he's, he's, he's talking about sheep and shepherds, people that climb out of the way. They're nothing but secret, fraudulent, deceptive. They're thieves, kleptes. The second word robber is Lestes, L-E-S-T-E-S. This is like Barabbas. Openly violent and stealing. You know there's a big difference. There's, there's, there's these corporate thieves and they steal money from their corporation without anybody knowing. And then there's the guy that breaks into your house. Okay? He's an open, violent robber. They're both thieves, aren't they? The guy that's sitting, the guy that's sitting in a government office with a position in the government and is misusing money is no different than the open robber. And Jesus is understanding. And so in churches, in, 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 not churches, but in voices, the voices that you could hear, some are these, they're very deceptive and very secret. That's what JWs are, Mormons are. They use the name of Jesus, right? Yeah, they're very deceptive and very secret, and they will try to convince you all the time. I was in uh, Zambia one day. We had a meeting with seven pastors. They wanted to affiliate. And uh, I was there with Pastor Ronaldo and a couple other people. So they sat down and we started talking. I said, oh, before we really enter into any dialogue about affiliation, I said, do you believe that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and Jesus is the Holy Spirit? Jesus only? He goes, oh yeah. I said, get out of the room. Get out of my room. That was the end of that. What were they? They were deceptive. Okay? They were deceptive, secret, fraudulent. I said, stand up and leave this room. And you say, why don't you try to like, no, 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 no. They were filled with error and they were deceptive, secret, trying to come in and do some damage. And if you associate with them when you enter a country, you, you, you line up and people begin to think that you're with them. Be very careful when you plant the churches who you hang out with. I say nobody. Because you don't know if somebody's joining you, especially if you're a foreigner going into another country. You have no idea, the people that are coming to you, what they're all about. What they've been doing for the last 20 years, 10 years. What's their reputation in the city? Because there's people that will try to set you up. Hello? I said to one guy one time, how long have you been working for the government as you've been sitting here in our Bible class? He goes, what? I said, you think I don't know? God told me. 
the first year you entered in that you were a spy, a government spy trying to distort our doctrine to get some of us kicked out of the country because we're Americans. I said, and I don't care. Do what you want. And he was never there again, never came back again. And it's the way it is. Secret. Sitting there. You know, there's, there's some people that come to Bible school, they, they believe some strange things, and they actually think they're going to convince students and convince the ministry of what they believe. You'll never, you ain't going nowhere, baby. We've been doing this for like 50 years. What do you think you're going to do? Convince us? Huh? I'll just do it secretly and quietly, and I'll get one pastor aside at a time and try to talk to them about you know, what, I, what really is the gift of tongues. Oh, oh that's so sweet. Have you ever seen forceps? Um, they're very good on tongues. They're these instruments they use, you know. I'll tell you later. Either that or I'll have him use them on you. And you'll see. Thieves and robbers, they steal truth from the church and the Christian, okay? Think about it. They're Jesus... Jesus said point blank what they were, thieves and robbers. Legalism, thieves and robbers. People that believe in works, manipulation, thieves and robbers. All these, all these, fi all these false anointings, thieves and robbers. What's another word that he uses here? Strangers. It's a stranger's voice, false doctrine. False doctrine. How about a hireling? Misothos, one who doesn't care has no care for anybody, anything. No care. Does it for the job only, the money only. How much am I going to get paid if I'm the pastor? Huh? Really? I just had a case I'm dealing with now overseas. And, and I said, the real reason you're leaving the ministry and criticizing the pastor is because we cut your support when you came off the mission field and you really have a lust for money and position. So I said, I love you, I'll always be your friend, but if that's the way it's going to be, I pray that God blesses your family in your new adventure with a Korean church that you don't even agree with their doctrine, but you're taking a job anyway. Hireling. It's a hireling. Hireling, a wolf. Wolf, wolf speaks of the old sin nature. Okay? Carnal. So look at you guys. You got thief. You got robber. You got stranger. You got a hireling. You got wolf. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd of the what? By the way, sheep need protection from these things, don't they? Listen to these things. I mean, wolf, hireling, stranger, thief, and robber. Is it important to hear the voice of God? Huh? Very important to hear the voice of God. All right? Very important to hear the voice of God. Now, turn to John chapter 1. Well, before we turn to John chapter 1, I want to give you some principles. Um, is it okay? Okay. I thought there was like somebody said they didn't want to hear that. Or something. No. I went, I'm going to give you some basic principles of interpretation that I have put together in the last 20 years from different people that are very much experts on interpretation. Bernard Ram and Dwight Pentecost, okay? Don't let the name fool you. He's a, he's a strong, fundamental believer. Right, Pastor Manny? Dwight Harrison. Okay, here's, this is, here's some principles. And just if you write them down, these maybe will help you in years to come. This is from Bernard Ram, his... Uh, interpretation book number one when you are looking at the Bible always remember the purpose of the Bible it's principle number one remember the purpose of the Bible to glorify God okay to know him and to glorify him don't try to interpret the Bible without understanding the purpose of the Bible all right number two in interpretation am I going too fast thank you not yet. We have a no and a not yet. I interpret that as I should slow up a bit. 
Number two, remember when you are involved with interpreting the Bible, who is he speaking to? To whom is the book or the passage addressed? All right? Can I give you an understanding of that for a minute as we stop there? Do you know, have you ever researched why Paul addressed the problem in Corinth with tongues and hair? Do you, you ever know why? Anybody have, anybody have any idea why? Or maybe you're in the class to find out. Here's the reason why. In Corinth, there was a cultic group of people that were very powerful throughout the Greek Empire. And in this cultic group of people, there were women prophets who had no hair. They shaved their heads bald. And they would be somehow intoxicated with fumes in the worship that they did because there was intoxicating kind of drugs that were used. And they would inhale these things and start speaking in inintelligible, unintelligible languages. I don't know if you know that. It's the only church he ever addressed it. Do you ever wonder why? Huh? There was the, the cult of Aphrodite. It was a very strange group of people. Now, these people entered the church. They got saved. But guess what? Some of these things remain with people after they get saved. That's when he was talking about hair, you know, the, the, a woman's hair and all that stuff there, and, and about speaking in tongues. Because it was controlling the church. It was controlling the church. So he had a problem with the women. He had a problem with the women in respect to the hair thing, with the tongues thing. It was all about women in that particular ministry. So if, do you, when he's speaking to the Corinthians, do you understand what's going on in Corinth? Do you understand when Paul is addressing the book of Colossians, he's talking to people that are surrounded by a bunch of people that really believe some strange things, some cultic things, and they, they enter, they get saved. And sometimes they try to bring that thinking into the what? Into the church of the truth. But it's the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. <coughs> so Paul writes addressing those things. He writes addressing those things. In Philippi, he had two women that were trying to take control of the church, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And he addressed it. He addressed humility. Why? Because there was pride in the church. To whom? So the second principle is, to whom is the scripture being addressed? In its principle, of course, it's, all scripture is for our benefit. But there's an understanding and interpretation. Who is he talking to? Now, if somebody, if somebody goes out on Sunday and picks up sticks, are you going to stone him? Huh? Hello? Yeah. How long, oh God? <laughs> <laughs> but they did it in the Bible. To whom was it addressed? What was the reason for that? See, this is so important. We've got to look and say, what's going on here? So that's principle number two. Number three, the context. When, when something is written, what is the context? What's going on there? What's in front of it, okay? What's behind it? What, ch what chapter is it in? What book is it in? What's the context of what's being said? The context, all right? Number four, a basic principle of hermeneutics is you must study doctrine, progressive, systematic, similar topics that are in harmony. You take a thought from Genesis to Revelation for interpretation. All right? Are you with me? You, you take it all the way in the Bible. That's called doctrinal interpretation. Doctrine. You don't just pull a verse out and say, I'm going to build my life on this verse. Here's a good verse for you. Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> Why don't you just obey that? What's the context of that? You know? Well, Absalom did it. No, he, yeah, he did hang himself. You could build a doctrine on let's all go hang ourselves. Because <laughs> we see it in the Bible. You know, that's what it says. Here's how I'm going to let God speak to me. I'm going to open my Bible and point. Wherever my finger lands, that's what I'm going to believe today. Whew. Don't laugh. There's people that are like that. Next. Next. Number five. Exegesis. E-X-E-G-I-S-I-S. -I -I -S. 
Go to the Hebrew and the Greek. All right? There's 29 words for the word come in the Bible. C-O-M-E in English. You'll find 29 Greek and Hebrew words for that one word. You've got to exegete the scriptures. And by the way, exegesis means taking out of the Bible, not reading into the Bible. Okay? See, you, when you go to the Bible, you take out what it says. You don't put your mind into it to come up with your own interpretation. Well, God has given every green leaf for our benefit, so they, get, they smoke dope. <laughs> Weirdo. Oh, really? They read into it, right? Right? Jacob had, uh, you know, six wives. He was disobedient. He was disobedient. He got chastised for 24 years. Hello? They read into what they want it to say for the benefit of their own flesh. Oh, yeah. Look at all the money Abraham had. Prosperity. Yeah, Jesus had no place to lay his head, though. How about that part? Exit Jesus using the Hebrew and Greek. And number six, leaven. Don't bring leaven into the Bible. Don't put anything into it through subjectivity. Just take out what it says. And that's Proverbs 30, 5 and 6, and Re Revelation 22, 17 and 18. So don't, put, don't bring any leaven into it or take leaven out of it by coming up with your own subjective interpretation. All right? Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. It is what it says, okay? It is what it says. Don't try to, you know... Of course we know, and we'll see this in the next group of, of principles here before we take a break. These are principles now from Dwight Pentecost. All right? Are you with me? I knew I had to give you some of this kind of stuff. I, you know, I know Pastor Duane and Pastor Eugene are going through the principles of hard tells, but I, want, I just wanted to get this out. Number one, take a word in its ordinary use unless you have no choice. A word is a word. Now, when it says God is a rock, it doesn't mean he's a rock on a beach. Okay? God is a lamb. He's not a real lamb, is he? It's a principle. So you take a word in its ordinary use unless there's no other choice. And it's very clear that it couldn't be that. God is not a rock, is he? Hmm? It means stability, certainty, fixed, right? It's a principle. So you take it as a principle. But when you look at a word in the Bible, take it at its... Don't try to like, well, I wonder what that really means. You know, what does that really mean? You know, wine is a mocker. What does that mean? You know, what well, means wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Don't read into it. Don't try to change the ordinary use of the word. Okay? Adulterers will go to hell. <laughs> okay? You want to change it? Now, we understand grace and mercy in the finished work. But he's talking about people that are unsaved and people that have never been regenerated and people that live in that. Hell awaits them. And hell is hell. It's not some you know, annihilation thing. So the ordinary use of the word, unless there's no other option, and there are words that there's no other option. God's a rock. God's a lamb. Next, number two, if a word has several uses, spiritually select that which suits the circumstances. Sometimes a word can have different uses, all right? And you have to allow the Holy Spirit, along with these other principles, for you to select the best use of that word that fits the context of the circumstances, all right? Three, here's the word called etymology, E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-Y. You got that, Molly? Etymology. It means how a word is formed. When you're interpreting the Bible, the words are formed a certain way when you look at them in the original language. Let me give you an example, etymology, how a word is formed. Now watch. Every time M-A-I is at the end of a Greek word, it speaks of the results of God. 
whenever you see M-A-I at the end, it speaks of the results sourced in God. Let me give you how a, how a etymology of a word. Stir up. You ever read that in 2 Timothy 1.6? Hello? Anna zo poreo. Anna. A-N-A. Again. Zo. Fire. Uh, uh, life. Poreo. Fire. Again. Life's fire. Okay? That's called etymology. You take a word apart and get its meaning. Anna zo poreo. So in the Greek and Hebrew languages, it's important to, to understand when you're interpreting the Bible etymology, how a word is what? How a word is formed. And that can make all the difference in the world, by the way. You can get a crino or creases and then add anacrino or anacresis, and it changes the definition of the word. Next, what number is this? Four. Four. There are some similarities in words, but they may be different words. Like when you read kingdom and glory, many times it's referring to the same thing. So there are distinctions and similarity in words. They're synonymous words. They're very much, they mean the same thing. Sometimes you'll see the word kingdom, sometimes you'll see the word glory, but it will refer to the same thing. In some of the verses you could find that it is Matthew 20, Verse 4, Matthew 18, 7 through 9, Mark 10, 31, and Mark 9, 47. You'll find that one time it says, and it's the same, very same thing, one time it says kingdom, one time it says glory. But there's similarity there. Next, number what? Five. This is context. And this is a, this is a long one here. Okay? This is a long one. Context, and I made mention of that before. Number one, when you think about context, think about similar passages in the Bible. So, in other words, when I'm interpreting according to context, like here's a, here's a similar passage. Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 5. Fill with the Spirit, fill with the Word. Similar passages. There's a lot of similar passages in the Bible. So if you want to determine and interpret the Bible correctly with the right context, look for similar passages. You can find a lot of them in the three synoptic Gospels. Matthew, right, Mark, and Luke. They're same eye. They're very similar. There's very many similar things there. Maybe one time, you know, did you ever hear about how Jesus healed blind men blind man so many different ways? Some he said, he spit and he made mud, you know. Somebody just said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. You know, so there's people that try to figure out how to, how to heal, how we heal blind men, and they're, they're so confused because there's so many ways he did it. But healing, okay. Next, similar passage. Next, always look at the verses in front of and after a verse. Don't try to just interpret a verse out of the Bible, but look at number one, we said similar passages. Number two, what do the verses say in front of it, and what do the verses say behind it? It may help you to explain the verse if it's controversial. Are you with me? Next, in context, look at the chapter, and I know that they didn't have chapter numbers and chapter verses. They didn't have those numbers and chapters there, but look at what is being addressed there. 1 Corinthians 13 is all about what? Love. So, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them who love him. So, you, that's, here's what the chapter is talking about. Hebrews 11 is about what? Faith. You can see there's entire chapters or sections of the Bible on a certain topic. Next, look at what book is this Bible written in? Uh, what book is this verse in? All right? What book is it in? You find it in Daniel. It's, it'll mean a lot more as far as interpretation comes, you might need to know that this is from Daniel versus this is from Matthew. Something like that. What book is it in? Is it, is it in uh, Leviticus? Is it in uh, Philippians? What book? Next, is it Old Testament or New Testament? Context has to do a lot with OT or New T. Context, okay? OT, New T. Next, 
Look at all the scripture when you want to interpret something. All the scripture, okay? As many scriptures as you can find. All scripture. We already said parallel passages. Find the parallel and similar passages in all scriptures, all right? So that's, that can help you when you think about context. And you are cross-referencing things, verbally cross-referencing things, okay? All right, Father, thank you for this half of the class. Bring us back alive in Jesus' name, amen. Okay.